Tonight, kicking off International Women's Day with an evening filled with inspiring conversations. You make me want to go now and do a better job. From entrepreneurs to politicians and Juno-nominated performers, we're live at the concert hall with more on tonight's celebration. We can't hire. Uh, we can't give raises or anything like that due to funding. Plus, the challenges discussed at a round table in the Jane and Driftwood neighborhood aimed at addressing gun violence. It's incredible. It, there's, no, there's no words to describe it. I mean, it's just absolutely mind-blowing. And shocker down at the lake, why it's such a big deal to have Toronto's first documented bald eagle nest. Good evening, I'm Chris Glover. We'll get to those stories in a moment, but we begin with breaking news and a major update to our top story from last night. Officials both here and in the U.S. confirming late tonight that the five people killed in a fiery plane crash on Monday in Nashville were in fact a GTA family. Nashville police identifying the pilot as 43-year-old Victor Dutsenko. His wife Rima and their children were also on board. David, aged 12, Adam, 10, and Emma, 7. In a statement, the mayor of King Township confirming the family lived in the town. The statement reads, I extend our deepest condolences to the families and friends of the Dutsenko family from our community who tragically lost their lives. We stand together in mourning the loss and offer offer our support to all those affected by this tragedy. Now the plane took off from Ontario on Monday night and was based out of Brampton Caledon Airport. Today CBC News obtained the plane's recent flight history. Since last July the data suggests the plane was only ever taken on short trips in Ontario and once to and from nearby Pennsylvania. Then on Monday the plane made two stops in the U.S. before flying to Nashville. That's by far the longest trip listed and it stands out for this former investigator. It certainly seems like he would be at the low end of the experience scale uh, to undertake a flight like this, especially at night and over that long of a distance. When this type of thing happens, it, it affects all of us and we all question our own safety and we're all going to go brush up on our emergency procedures. U.S. investigators are expected to look at factors including the pilot's level of experience as they work to determine what went wrong. A preliminary report is expected to be released in the coming weeks. Now to a night celebrating women at the concert hall in the city's downtown. And it may still be two days ahead of International Women's Day, but the festivities have clearly already begun. Tonight's event bringing together women leaders, including in politics, tech, and music. And our Anam Khan is live outside the event. Anam, give us a sense of how the night went down. <laughs> Chris, it just wrapped up not too long ago and it was a party in there. The room was filled with hundreds of inspiring and powerful women who made their marks in different fields. And when I spoke to the manager of the venue, he told me that tickets just went flying. They, went sold, they were sold out really quickly before people even knew what the event really was. A room filled with hundreds of women from diverse backgrounds at the concert hall, celebrating their successes ahead of International Women's Day. Winery owner Sherry Carlo is one of them. We created the first vegan certified wine in the world in 2012. And in a 12 month period, we just won 23 gold medal scores. With women sipping on her wine at the event, the entrepreneur is hoping to encourage others to break boundaries. All you have to do is surround yourself with people who are smarter than you, as they say, and uh, just keep your eyes on the road in front of you. Stay out of the ditch. <laughs> the event was a partnership between the Toronto Network of Women and Infotech Women's Network. It was filled with stories to inspire, along with panels, speeches, and lots of networking. You're going to hear a lot of women on the panel that came up through the ranks. Uh, you know, when men, typically there was men in leadership and they made it to, uh, to very senior roles, which is very inspiring for the young, up-and-coming females. The event put a spotlight on Mayor Chow's win last year, the first racialized woman to become the mayor of Toronto. I did not see people in leadership that looks like me. I did not see the possibility that I could be a leader. 
a historical win that was not lost on the women at the event. You make me want to go now and do a better job. No, it was true. Like, it was the best thing you could have said for me tonight. If we do not have equal voice, equal representation, the service that I provided by the city will never be perfect. And it's not just about business and politics. Women in music were celebrated as well. The Toronto band Samantha Martin and Delta Sugar played some of their Juno-nominated songs. I'm a very alpha female. I bring a very sort of energy, I guess, maybe to the industry. And I, I definitely try to pull other female artists up with me as I come up because a lot of female artists who came before me did that for me. Chris, this is just the beginning. International Women's Day is actually on Friday, and there will be plenty of celebrations across the city and the province. But that seemed like quite a powerful night. Thank you very much, Adam Khan, reporting live for us tonight. International Women's Day came up at Queen's Park today as well. A Liberal MPP asking the legislature to allow independent members to speak for a few minutes tomorrow to address International Women's Day. But the Ford government shot that request down. I seek unanimous consent that notwithstanding Standing Order 40E, five minutes be allotted to the independent members as a group to respond to the ministerial statement tomorrow on International Women's Day. Agreed? No. I heard a no. Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity later reminded female MPPs that they'd be invited to take part in a photo for International Women's Day. After that, yelling could also be heard. And speaking to reporters after, the Liberal MPP who made the initial request said she felt insulted. This is not a partisan issue, so it's very hard to justify why the government is silencing us, silencing women. CBC Toronto reached out to the Ford government to ask why the request to speak was denied. And in a statement, the government said independent members in Ontario have far greater participation abilities than others in Canada. In Vaughan, a woman described as a dedicated teacher was found dead in her home last night. Her husband is now charged with murder. Just before 12.30 this morning, York Regional Police received a call at an address on Isa Court in Vaughan. When we arrived on scene, we found a female with serious injuries and she was later pronounced at the scene. Police later identified the woman as 64-year-old Estella Wheeler. 68-year-old Trevor Wheeler was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. The TDSB confirming tonight that Estella Wheeler was a teacher at its Afrocentric alternative school. In a letter sent home to parents, the school's principal says she was a dedicated team member who cared for all her students, adding she developed strong relationships with students and staff and will be remembered as an incredibly kind and giving person who is friends with everyone. The school says support is available for staff and students who need it. In Hamilton, a man is dead after what police are calling a targeted shooting this afternoon. There is believed to be a vehicle involved in this, uh, in this incident, and uh, it, it, the information that we are receiving, um, some of the information we have received is that uh, the individual has fled in a vehicle. All right, so here's what we know. It happened around 1 in the afternoon in the King West and McNabb area of the downtown, and police say it appears the victim, a 19-year-old Hamilton man, was shot multiple times. And Toronto police have identified the victim in a shooting over the weekend. 25-year-old Jasmit Badesha of Mission BC was shot and killed on Sunday night in the area of Bergamont Drive and Rexdale Boulevard. No arrests have been made in that case. Focusing in now on an important roundtable discussion that took place today at Jane and Driftwood. Residents in that neighborhood gathered to discuss solutions to gun violence. And it comes after a pair of bus stop shootings nearly three weeks ago that left one man dead and a boy with life-altering injuries. Police say both of them were innocent victims. Dale Manuktuk has more. A teddy bear, flowers and pictures lay against the bus stop near Jane and Driftwood. The makeshift memorial, a reminder today of the violence that spilled over here last month when a 16-year-old boy was shot in the face and a 39-year-old newcomer to Canada were killed. 
A group of around 30 gathered at a nearby community center to talk solutions. We're always trying to adjust and, and understand how we can address the reactive side in the aftermath of violence, but also from the preventative side, which is why we're here today. Police were joined by politicians, community leaders, and people impacted by gun violence. We are going to make sure that each and every one of us come together as a collateral body and do what's right for the Jane and Finch community. A lot of groups that took part in the round table work with vulnerable youth. They would like to expand services, but funding is a challenge. We can't hire. Uh, we can't give raises or anything like that due to funding. We're very limited to what we do. And um, a lot of our staff do things beyond, you know, that we should do, right? But because we care. The main issue that came up was young people and ensuring that they have resources and know where to find them. But making the connections with them isn't that easy. Growing up in this community myself, uh, I knew who I could connect to and who I couldn't. And as Andrea mentioned earlier, familiar faces, being here day in and day out are, are some of the ways that residents who are doing this work are connecting with at-risk youth. There was hope coming out of the meeting, not just for issues that are a challenge for Jane and Finch, but citywide. If we're to look at just one community in regards to these issues, um, and we solve those problems in this one specific community, it's not going to solve the issues everywhere else. You know, we can't look at something, uh, one issue at a time, especially when it comes to such a dense network like the City of Toronto. Local Councillor Anthony Peruzza says the result of the meeting was a list of short-term and long-term actions that can be taken. Immediately, they'll be looking at increasing lighting in the community as well as the police presence. Long-term, they'll be establishing a working group to figure out how to create safe spaces for youth. The Almanac Duck, CBC News, Toronto. All right, hopping outside for a live look at the city right now, and it is four degrees and some light drizzle. Colette is here with a first look at the forecast, and Colette, not a lot of sun today, but otherwise, not a bad day either. Yeah, that's right, Chris. I mean, a little bit of a reset of our temperatures, but still feeling pretty mild, all right, even with, uh, you know, the cloud cover and some of the drizzle uh, in some cases. Daytime highs, it doesn't mean they necessarily come in the afternoon. So, for example, Oshawa, that was at midnight last night where you had the double digits. Didn't get there this afternoon, but Toronto, yeah, uh, we struggled there, but to 8 degrees. And London even hit uh, double digits today, actually in uh, the afternoon hours, early afternoon. So, uh, a look ahead head at what we have to look forward to and that is high pressure building in and what that means are some clearing skies. Uh, so with that, we will have some cooler readings overnight tonight, but as we get into the day tomorrow, it sets us up for sunshine. Now the clouds will be uh, a little slower to move out there in southwestern Ontario. So clouds in the morning, but then you will get into some sun winds are then becoming kind of variable, but just a really nice day and temperature still above seasonal, maybe not record setting, but they will be above seasonal. So after one tonight, uh, Toronto, how about nine degrees tomorrow? We do have a system on the way for the week. Weekend, Chris, uh, details on that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good tease. Thank you, Colette. Next to City Hall, where councillors will soon consider a wave of transit projects for Toronto. And tonight, a new city report suggests a focus on dedicated busways. City Hall reporter Sean Jeffords has the details. Whether because of affordability or practicality, this view down Morningside Avenue might become a familiar sight across Toronto in the years to come. Bus rapid transit or dedicated lanes like this figure prominently in a new transit plan coming to City Council. Mayor Olivia Chow says that as Toronto plans for the future, its ability to pay for transit expansion has to be front and centre. We always want to find the best solution that is the most affordable solution. Busway is absolutely one of them. LRT is less expensive than subways. And if we have all the money in the world, of course, we start with subway and then LRT and then busway. Uh, but if we don't have much, then I think we just be practical and look at doing what we can. Toronto was starting to plan its next transit system expansion for the 2030s. To do that, city staff have evaluated 24 proposed projects. Nine projects on the top 10 list are bus rapid transit lines. That doesn't surprise the chair of the TTC board. I think in terms of looking at value for money, in terms of like moving people efficiently, it makes a lot of sense to sort of focus on like those very straightforward wins. 
but putting bus lanes on some of the city's busiest streets could be more challenging than it seems, says this transit advocate. Even the Rapid TO stuff, there are places they're already running into severe pushback from residents and businesses. You want to take a lane, you know, out of a four lane street for buses? Are you crazy? City staff also stress that Toronto needs to maintain the current system. That's not an easy task with a structural operating deficit that last year topped $1.8 billion. And Toronto's unfunded capital program is nearly $34 billion. Almost $17 billion of that is for the TTC and other transit projects. This planning expert says tackling that is vital. Uh, the existing system has been run down over the years. Uh, recently, people are experiencing slow trains on some of the lines uh, because the tracks are not uh, uh, are, are, are starting to suffer from uh, state of good repair issues. So uh, it's really important that the first dollar spent is a dollar spent on maintenance to make sure this existing system is uh, working as it should. This report will act as a guide for city councillors as they plan transit expansion across Toronto in the next number of years. City staff will also be granted some early authority to advance planning work. City Council will dig into the report at a meeting at City Hall later this month. Returning now with some exciting news down by the lake, the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority confirming to CBC Toronto that the first documented bald eagle nest has been found in Toronto. And as Patrick Swadden tells us, it's not just cool to see, it says a lot about the region's biodiversity. Two swans frolic under the morning light along a Toronto waterway. But they're not the only majestic creatures in attendance as two bald eagles survey the area from their new home. It's incredible. It, there's, no, there's no words to describe it. I mean, it's just absolutely mind-blowing. Jules McCusker spotted the two birds of prey in December. Well, the first thing I thought was that it was impossible. Impossible because nobody's seen a nest in the city. While it's not abnormal to spot one of the iconic birds, the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority confirming to CBC News that this is the first documented bald eagle nest in Toronto. The eagles have landed. Duke Redbird, a good friend of McCusker, says... The eagle's nest is a good omen. It's a very sacred uh, bird to us and represents so many good things. Uh, uh, honor, honesty, charity, life, uh, and, and all the things that are good. And it's not just the cultural significance or importance to Indigenous communities. Scientists say a bald eagle nest in Toronto bodes well for the region's biodiversity. The bald eagle wasn't historically doing very well. It wasn't endangered for a long time. John Sparrow with the Toronto Zoo says this was largely due to the hunting of eagles in the 1900s and pervasive use of an insecticide called DDT that harmed local ecosystems and caused eagle eggs to crack under any weight. And DDT was banned in the 70s in North America and we did see a drastic increase with other conservation efforts. They were at the brink of extinction at that time. This expert says the bald eagle population reached a low point in the late 1960s when just a few hundred breeding pairs were left before those regulations took effect. They are exploring new areas that they haven't explore, explored in a while and then nesting there. Drescher says climate change is also playing a role in the return as water bodies abundant in fish, a typical eagle prey, have less ice. The TRCA adding, bald eagles have a low tolerance to contaminants. The nest suggesting that Toronto's aquatic ecosystem continues to improve. We have to remember to, to respect that nest. Uh, they can be very sensitive at this time, especially the first three months. They're very critical when they're nest building, when they're laying eggs, and they're raising really small chicks. Sparrow says any major disturbance can cause them to abandon that nest. I hope others share the sentiment of wanting to see these uh, eagles thrive and make a home, like a long-term home. A caution to Torontonians to let the birds be. Let's hope that the little eaglets that uh, are hatched this year as a result uh, will we'll just uh, spread their joy around, around Toronto. Patrick Swadden, CBC News, Toronto. All right, let's get back to you, Colette, and a decent, warm, and sunny day coming tomorrow, and then you teased ahead a bit of a system headed our way by the weekend, right? 
Yeah, I guess I did do that, didn't I? I talked about how great tomorrow is going to be, but then I was teasing about what's coming for the weekend. So let's go through all of that here as we look at our weather conditions headlines in terms of, yes, a beautiful day on tap for Thursday. A lot of sunshine will even start off pretty good on Friday, but then clouds will be increasing and uh, rain will push into the GTA and linger into Saturday. And then as we get a cold shot of uh, air coming in on Sunday, a chance that any kind of lingering moisture there could mix over to some wet flurries. So that is what we have in store. But I will tell you, uh, very rainy conditions persisted today, just south and east of the lower Great Lakes. So we had a, yeah, a little drizzle here, some light showers, and a bit more than that into eastern Ontario. But uh, this is the primary event with those two systems coming together. It is going to make for a messy, wintry uh, situation situation for Atlantic Canada, but high pressure uh, protecting us and pushing that away from our region. And with that, there's that sun as we go into not only Thursday, but then into Friday. We will have it kind of from, oh, say the west end of Lake Ontario and north into central Ontario and east. However, you will get into those cloudy conditions there. Uh, London, Sarnia, uh, towards Windsor, Chatham, Kent, through those areas. So you'll have, uh, you won't get that morning with at least some sun on Friday. The clouds will be there. The rain will move in. They'll hold off till evening hours, though, uh, pushing into Toronto. And it's early yet to be looking at the numbers, but to give you an idea, it's not just some light showers. We are talking about uh, rain there Friday night and through the day Saturday. By the end of the day Saturday, 20 to perhaps as much as 30 millimeters of rainfall. A snapshot here of your temperatures at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. Perhaps that's when you'll be heading out the door. So some cool numbers. I actually think Toronto will be down at about 1. Uh, but there'll be some at the freezing mark. And then Thursday looks good. The temperatures run above seasonal, even if they're not into the double digits. And we're only resetting their Sunday crisp back closer uh, to seasonal in terms of those numbers. All right, thanks for the reminder. And that's it for us tonight. I'll be back with you again tomorrow night at 11, and we'll see you then.